And welcome everybody to Energy Crew Podcast. I'm your host, JP Warren. And before we begin, I got to say, check out Energy Crew on a whatever podcast. Well, obviously you're listening to this now, but go ahead, like, uh, and uh, leave a review. Love to get uh, feedback to kind of see uh, how things are going. Uh, it'll be appreciated. And we're actually, what else do I have to plug? Oh, Energy Energy underscore crew on Instagram. Check it out. We've got a lot of content pertaining to the, to the podcast and the industry. So go ahead and check that out. I even drop some memes there occasionally. So that should be enjoyable. So we are recording, filming this at the Petroleum Club of Houston in the dining room with a beautiful skyline, kind of a gloomy day. I'll take that. I'm um, coaching my kids' uh, first soccer practice today. We'll get into that too in a little bit. But uh, for those that are wondering who's on the other line of the mic right now, this is Hank Porter, the operations manager at Lime Rock Resources. That is it. That's that's it, huh? That that's it. I'm done. Yeah, we're that's done. That's, that's a wrap. Thanks for everyone for tuning in. And uh, so anyway, man, I'm kidding. So first off, first off, thank you for your time, man, yeah. coming in here. No problem. And I love getting uh, operators on. I love getting you know uh, my buddies, my service uh, buddies on. I w- I'm looking forward to this because you have the experience that there's some there's some operators that have this that have sat both sides of the table, mm-hmm. both on the start off on the service side that have wound up on the operator side and vice versa. So y'all's perception, y'all's insight is like. I, I dig it. You know what I mean? You know, you know, you, you, I love how you're able to kind of empathize or, or put yourself in other people's shoes and all that stuff. So anyway, so I'd love to get this kicked off, man. Let's do it in the fashion that first off, how are you today? Good, good. I'm, you, it's actually enjoyable sitting here watching you. I've, I've listened to the podcast a few times, but seeing how you articulate your radio voice in person is very entertaining. My face changes and it goes oh, down a little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? You definitely get that intense look. So when you listen to me, does it frustrate you like it frustrates my wife with all the ums and the filler words and all that stuff? Because I have tried to be cogn- I've tried to like be cognizant of that, but at the end of the day, it's like, man, I just got to be me. Just say screw, just go with it. You know, I, I've been through management training and speech training. The only way to change it is to record yourself, go back and watch it. But you said you don't watch oh, yourself. I just get, I just, I, I fast forward through my like tangents of shit that I always just talk about. Like I'll have one question, I'll just expand that, expand that. So, yeah, I usually fast forward to like yeah. what the guest is talking about. I mean, a lot of practice and watch your own videos is the only way you're going to change it. Oh, I just, so you can tell I, your wife I, I it, cringe it is what so it is. much. That's what I'm telling yeah. her. I just, I just cringe so much every time I'm like, gosh, JP, you're going to say, uh, there. Like, trust me, I'm going to watch this. I'm like, JP, come on, man. I mean, I, I know for fact that some of the higher CEOs of different companies, I mean, they do this and practice and change their speech because they have to. Because every little word they say can then change an investor or yes. change their stock price and everything. That's got to be pretty uh, stressful to kind of be in that situation, I'd yeah. imagine. I mean, like I said, previous comes on, oh, I've worked for, I've heard the stories of the CEOs or higher ups, you know, going through all this specific training and detail orientation. Um, you know, know what to say, what you can't say. Yeah. And I mean, at one point in my career with Halliburton, they had this management training classes. They brought in some professors actually from LSU. It was when I was in South Louisiana. Okay. And this one touch professor who always stuck with me talked about uh, your default face. Because basically, as soon as you turn around and look yourself in the mirror, that's the first perception that people have of you. And Ooh. 90% of what they think of you is that very first perception. And in order to so. change your default face, it's, it takes a lot of work. Because he told a lot of stories. He was actually coaching the football players on how to give, you know. Uh, like post-game yeah, commentary or whatever. Exactly. yeah. yeah. And different players would have different perceptions. He said even himself, like students thought he was this really mean guy and he was like super nice, but because he always had this certain look on his face and walked down the hall and he had to teach himself to change that. Cause I feel mentality. like if you have that face, I mean, you be, I, I feel like if people are hesitant to come talk to you, you're, you're not approachable. Even yeah. though, even though it, was, it might be important, it might not be important. Someone might just kind of want to get your counsel. Like if you have that, that, what do you call it, Default face yeah. or resting bitch face in the, in the wild out there. That's what it's called. So yeah, you can't be approachable or, you know, people no, aren't and, comfortable and, having the conversations with you. Yeah. And that works on the operator side, service side. I mean, it depends on what, what kind of person you want to be. If you want to be that person at the operator that you don't want salespeople to talk to you. Have that face. Have that face. How but do you, so how do you change? How do you, so you practice just like your ums and eyes. You really have to relax, turn, look at yourself in the mirror and see what it looks like. And then realize that that's what people think of you when they first see you. I, so you just added another an, an additional thing for me to be self conscious about. So great, <laughs> appreciate that. That's a but that's a good point though. I mean, it's not just how you uh, communicate, how you approach yourself, because that's kind of what half of not even half of it verbal. Well, and it goes in the same application of uh, if you have a, a youthful face versus gray hair, and people think your experience level. 
Yeah. Because it's just a perception about you. And I've seen that throughout my career that if, you know, you have gray hairs, I think, oh man, that guy knows what he's talking about. He's so it's been, like, he knows it. It's like, no, no, he doesn't. He just, he just started doing the gray yeah. earlier. I mean, cause I've always, as you can tell, I've got the youth face. Yes. Uh, so I've always had that perception where people think I'm younger than I am or less experienced. And so I've always, you know, not had to prove, but as soon as I start talking to people and, and you know, they hear what I know, it's like, oh, okay. Okay. He knows yeah. his stuff. We're going to yeah. do it. Yeah. I plugged a boomer in there. He thought I was 29 at one point. I'm 41 years old. I was like, I'll take that boomer. Appreciate that. High five. Yeah. yeah. Why not? So let's get this kicked off, man. Yeah. So you, you've got a very interesting career that I kind of want to talk about uh, first. We'll kind of go off on this, the normal tangents that we mm -hmm. normally do. So where, where are you from? Where'd you grow up? How did you get to where you're at today? So, uh, grew up in South Louisiana. Okay. But family is from Texas, a little bit of Oklahoma. It's pretty much spent uh majority of my time, Texas, Louisiana. Okay. Back and forth. Um, you know, I was South Central, deep South Louisiana. So I grew up the very Cajun experience. Oil field. Oil field, fourth generation. So the, so I wanna kinda of stop there and kinda of talk about that because mm -hmm. our mutual friend, the guy that you know a lot longer, yeah. Marshall Brown, he's fourth generation oil mm -hmm. field too. So what was that like for you growing up, I guess, in that fourth generation of style? <sighs> You know, it was, I mean, my, my dad's told me stories that his grandfather, my great grandfather used to take tools out to rig sites by mule. Um, really? My grandfather went right out of high school, went to work on a rig, you know, worked on drilling rigs. I mean, uh, worked his way up as one point. He actually had his own drilling company, owned a couple of rigs. Okay. Uh, Onshore? Yep. Yeah. Okay. I mean, but this was probably, I, I don't know the exact dates. I'm going to throw out the 60s probably when he started that business. At some point in time, he moved the rigs to Africa, and I don't, I don't know which country, and the Civil War broke out, and he lost everything. Um, That's insane. And, and my grandmother's house growing up, she, she had this kid's table that was this wooden hand-carved table. Yeah. That was from Honduras. So at some point in time, he was in Honduras. I, I don't know where he, all he was. But he was around. Uh, yeah. I'll bet it's got to be so weird back then, or just like a, just a cool uh, experience to kind of view in on that, like just doing business international. But now you just do a Zoom meeting. Back then, I'll, I mean, who— yeah. I'll show you. I have just, I got a few old pictures I found of my dad's, of my grandfather and my grandmother on rig sites in Midland back in, I was assume the sixties, maybe fifties. Dude, if you don't mind sending them, yeah. I'd love to post them with this because I remember I had a, a conversation with Colin Cohn and he had this awesome picture from his grandfather. I think mm -hmm. it was in Kuwait and it was an offshore jackup and they were flaring on the sides and it was this beautiful yeah. picture. And I, I included that in the, in the previous podcast. So send yeah, it to I'm me, pretty dude. sure. And at some point in time, my grandfather was on the first Gulf of Mexico rig outside the side of land drilling a well. Um, and then my dad got into it, different aspects. He worked with my grandfather some, he started his own safety business most of the time when I was a okay. kid, selling a uh, fire boss, large scale fire extinguisher units, offshore rigs. And he okay. also had safety glasses, slew of things when I grew up. I don't know if safety um, was a thing back then. Well, that eighties. Yeah. It's getting there. Yeah. You, so yeah. you saw the, the tin hats, I feel like back in the eighties, right? It was before the uh, plastic hats. Uh, yeah. It was the transition. Yeah. It was a transition. transition. Time. Yeah, yeah. We're in a transition time too, right now in our industry. I feel yeah, like. Yeah. That is true. Yeah. We are. So. I mean, technology's anytime technology takes leaps and bounds, it transitions. So it and makes uh, sense. And also external factors of what's happened in our industry and the market and the capital yeah. not coming in all that stuff. So that's for later though. Yeah. So keep on talking about your grandma. Um, but at some point in time, my dad did work on some rigs. My grandfather could he actually, my entire life, his left hand was crushed. He crushed on a rig uh, before I was even born, and he's got ro steel rods okay. permanently installed in his hand. So that's, yeah, about then, about when safety really started to so, focus. So, yeah, so, okay, so starting a safety company. That um, makes sense. And then he got out of that when I was in high school. He's done different things, little service companies, technology, a, little, all, a slew of things. Um, at one point in time, my grandfather also had his own oil company, uh, drilling wells on my grandmother's property that she inherited in South Louisiana. Okay. And so I would say my professional career started in 2005, but first time I was on a well location, I was probably about four. That's what, that's what I would tell every young engineer. Yeah. Like, you know, okay. I was out there since I was four years old. Like, yeah. I know my stuff. So wait, so <laughs> is that what propelled you to get in the oil and gas industry, no. just being around it? Funny thing is I actually kind of tried to avoid it. Okay. Um, Why? Not, not that I wanted to. I just, you know, you don't really know the ins and outs or really understand it till you work in it. Um, and yeah. I won't say I tried to avoid it, but basically, you know, my parents and my extended family all went to Texas universities are all in Texas. I grew up in South Louisiana, had no connection to any schools. So that's why I didn't go to local. And I decided just, I wanted to do my own thing. So I went completely different direction and went to the university of Alabama. Okay. So I went completely different direction, uh, did engineering and. Well, how, how did you pick engineering? It's it just, it's something I always wanted to do. Like okay. I, 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 my dad, 
So funny story. My dad actually doesn't have an engineering degree, but he was at A&M. So I, let me back up. It took me 28 years of my life to, to actually sit down and follow my dad's college career. That's okay. how, it was a <laughs> interesting career. Uh, he went to UT. I finally asked him what happened. He told me he partied too much and failed out. That, that's still happening to, in today's yes. world. Uh, then he transitioned to Southwest Texas, which is Texas State now. Yes, yes. Got a business degree. Then he decided he wanted to get an engineering degree and went to A&M back when you had to be in the core. Okay. And he was there with my uncle who actually played football at the time at A&M. Okay. Started working on his engineering degree and then that's when Vietnam was happening. And so he figured he was going to get drafted. So instead of waiting to get drafted, he joined from the core because he went straight as an officer. Yes. And then he was in the Army Corps of Engineers in Vietnam. So then they trained him as an engineer. Whoa. That's okay. That's I've never heard this type of training before. And yeah. And then when he came, got done with his tour in Vietnam, he came back and instead of finishing his engineering degree, he got his MBA from a &M. Okay. So my dad thought like an engineer, but was a business guy. And so I basically grew up always thinking like an engineer and, you know, things made sense. I like to figure things out, understand okay. how they work. So you like breaking stuff down and putting them back together and just kind of playing yeah. with the bolts of things. Okay. Yeah. All right. And so it was, uh, you know, this is, I knew from the time I started looking at schools to go to, I was looking at engineering programs. So it wasn't even like I went to school and figured it out. I knew. You, you know, already knew. Well, that's not, I mean, that's probably more than most people. I didn't figure out what my major was in 19, 20, I feel like. Yeah. And for whatever reason, well, I know I thought I wanted to be a civil engineer because I wanted to not be in office all day, okay. which is what I do now. You know, <laughs> life changes. Uh, but I was in school for, I don't know, not even the first full semester. And I was like, oh, civil engineering, no, thank you. I'm going to mechanical. Okay. Um, partially because one of my professors told me an engineering joke that uh, civil engineers build the targets, mechanical engineers build the weapons. And I was like, yeah. And then civil engineering is a ton of chemistry. And I was like, I hate chemistry. And then also the mechanical engineer from everyone I spoke, because there's a lot of mechanical engineers in the industry. Um, I feel like it's more broad than, yeah. uh, than whether it's civil, whether it's petroleum, it's more broad. You can go to a lot of different industries with mechanical engineering. Me mechanical engineering is basically the do it all engineering. Right, yeah. You okay. get a little bit of everything, you know, in, through the engineering curriculum. Um, and then in the effort, not again, not the effort to purposely, I, I kind of always knew in the back of my head, I always end up old field. I was, you know, there's already been three generations ahead of me. Yeah. yeah. I knew it was common. I grew up, you know, whether it be just making trips out to the field with my grandfather or, or, you know, fishing around rigs every day. Yep. So it was, all, it was always in your life in some, a, clo a close degree. Yeah. Pretty much. Okay. And then, uh, then actually in college, so Alabama had this thing and they called it a, a co-op program, cooperative education, where as an engineer, you would, every other semester you would take off, you go work full time, 40 hours a week for a company as an engineering intern. Dude, that's great experience. Yeah. And then you go back to school and they do that every other semester. Okay. So you'd rotate to these different companies and the companies loved it because they got a full-time cheap engineer. Yeah. And they always had someone on staff because they rotate it all year long. So I ended up working uh, four semesters like that at Mercedes. Okay. I was a process engineer building cars. Where, where was the Mercedes uh, plant at? It was one right outside of Tuscaloosa. So okay. it was 20 minutes outside town. So it was actually great. I got paid 40 hours a week and then I lived still yeah, in college, college town. town. Yeah. It's not bad at all. And, and, plus, I, and plus, you didn't have any homework. You because you, yeah. you you knock you knock you knocked off. You're no, done. no. I mean, that's where I learned to stay out to two a.m. is to go to work at six a.m. That was before oh, God, I got I remember field. those days. Uh -huh. I remember those days. But yeah, so the, I was building M classes for a year and a half. Okay. Uh, okay. Anything from the body shop welding to the process building all the components. Did you enjoy that? I did. It was a great experience. I think I enjoyed it more because I enjoyed the people I worked with. Okay. And I, I had it in my head that that's what I wanted to do. Um, just because I liked the people and it's what I knew through college, but in beneficial, luckily they only had one open position when I graduated and me and a good buddy, uh, both applied for it, but he literally went back to college to work at Mercedes. Like he was a couple years older. He went to work at a high school and literally was like, I want to work there. And he went back to college. So he got the job luckily. Good. Yeah. But literally, I think a day later I got the offer from Halliburton. Um, so, so how, how did Halliburton come up? Uh, literally I was getting close last semester, getting close to graduating. And I was like, okay, you know, this Mercedes thing may not work out. I need to have a, you know, another job offer or look for something else. And, uh, I'm trying to remember, I think I just asked around my sister's friend's husband and a few other people, two, two different people, basically the same name of a Halbert manager in Lafayette. Okay. And I was going home for Thanksgiving and literally I just sent an email and said, Hey, I'd like to come talk to you about a possibility of a job. And he's like, yeah, sure. Come stop by. And so I went and met him. In person, we talked for a bit, and he's like, okay, well, I'm going to fly you back in two weeks for the second round of interviews. I was like, okay. Damn. We just had it for like 30 minutes. Um, 
I think he really liked the fact that I moved away from home and I was willing to travel. And then um, also, I think that says a lot about someone shooting someone an email, just want to chat, chat yeah. with them too. Like, I think that shows initiative. Yeah. And so I flew back two weeks later, got the job offer the day of graduation. Okay. That's um, pretty good. Yeah. It's pretty good timing. Yeah. And the only thing that was a little bit rough was uh, I had actually already had a trip booked to Nashville that New Year's um, for a bowl game just to go party in Nashville for New Year's. Nashville. And I, and originally when I interviewed, he was like, oh, you'll report like mid-January, early February. And the offer letter came and said January 2nd, be in South Texas, be in Corpus Christi or Alice, Texas. Okay. So I went to Nashville, did the party thing, went to the bowl game, drove, flew back to Louisiana, packed up my car and drove straight to South Texas. Within, so that's like a 12 hour, 24 hour uh, window, yeah. I guess. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so pretty much fresh out of college, you're mm. starting at Halliburton. Obviously you've been experienced in the oil and gas industry and all stuff. So what, what, what'd you get on Halliburton uh, doing what? So uh, I was a field engineer for production enhancement, which is hydraulic fracturing, basically. Okay. And did so, you, I mean, so did you enjoy, I guess, learning the, uh, because, uh, you know, a lot of people that get in the industry, they, they've they had, you know, an internship here and during the summer with an operator or here with a service company, whatever that looks like, you know what yeah. I mean? But you're going from a Mercedes uh, factory to being a field uh, engineer. So what was that like for you initially? I mean, I, I was all about it because I wanted to, you know, see something different. Yeah. Um, so I, I was excited about it, but. You know, I was talking about earlier how I hated chemistry. Well, first thing they started doing was teaching you tons of chemistry because you had to understand how the polymers work with the fluid chemicals and everything. I was like, oh, great. <laughs> um, but it, I mean, it was interesting because I mean, at the time they had a pretty good, they had a really good training program and it's kind of changed over time or gone away with the industry. But, you know, you go, they send you right off the bat, they sent you to locations to various job types. Saw a wireline job, saw a cement job, you know, had to you know, up at two o'clock in the morning, drive to location. Then you go through a couple weeks of a classroom training. And then you take that classroom training, you go straight back out to the fields of the job and see it in person. That's awesome. And you did that back and forth for six months. So you're getting the academic side of it, but you're also getting the real, real yeah. world experience that, that not, not yeah. a lot of people get. Yeah, okay. I like and, that. I mean, it was exhausting because I, I lived in Corpus Christi at the time. Yeah. And I literally sometimes I'd have to get up at 1 a.m. to be on job location for 6 a.m., which was a four-hour drive. Yeah. It was exhausting, but we, I mean, it was all a group of us that were right out of college. So we worked hard, but we partied hard. You know, we still if we, do. If we got back to Corpus at noon, yeah, we'd go to Hooters, you know. Oh, yeah. So it was a great time. Um, and then after the six months, since I was hired for the Gulf of Mexico uh, to work offshore, I did six months of that training. And I was actually the first one they did the training for like that for the Gulf of Mexico. Okay. And then I went. Like the first group? The first person. I was the only person. In oh, group. okay, cool. All right. They used to train everyone just straight to the you know Gulf of Mexico, and the training took longer. And they're trying to accelerate it by getting more experience faster. And this is in two thousand and five. Five, okay, yeah. all right. And so I was the first one they decided to send to the land training center, and then then go to offshore. Where'd you go offshore? So I lived in Lafayette, and I went everywhere. I mean, I was on the frack boats. Okay. So I hopped, you name it. I basically went to the rig. Did you ever go to the Noble Lars Boozy Garden? I don't know if I went to that one. I went tons of Shell BP. I went to Shelf. I went to Inland Barge. You just, um, so every jack up floater, whatever. Yeah. At the time, they basically had, uh, actually, when I first went there, they had three frack boats and they dropped one while I was there. And then they had a skid crew. The skid crew did in, did land or shallow water barge rigs. Sometimes we'd rig up on work boats. And then the, the boats would take all the Shelf deep water stuff. Did and, you like the offshore line? Actually, I loved it. I, I did mean, too, man. Looking back, it was a great because uh, the way we worked, and me and my a couple of my buddies, I got several that are still close from that time. And we look back and be like, man, that was a great time in our lives because we were getting paid. And there's you're not no, spending anything in those however long you're out. Well, there's no stress, and the way that we worked at the time was three weeks on call, one week off. Okay. On call. On call. Okay. Not offshore. Okay. And we had a pool of engineers, so you always knew a couple. You know, usually a day or two before you go out. Yeah. And so pretty much we were at the bars or offshore for, you know, three years. That is, you know what, that is 80s oil field life. And I love that. I love that. And, and I mean, only close, oh, I had, okay, I guess I had two close calls in that time period. But there was definitely one where I went with some friends to LSU game and got back like at three o'clock in the morning because I wasn't supposed to leave until three that afternoon, Sunday afternoon. Yeah. And at 7 a.m. they called me. I've been home for like four hours. He's oh. like, grab your bag and leave now. I was like, no, oh, okay. I want to sleep. I jumped in the... <laughs> The supervisor pickup truck and went to sleep in the back seat. And also, I mean, those boats, I mean, I'll, I'll go to sleep on those boats like that. Oh, did, you ever get, did you ever get sick on, on those boats? No. And I, I had been in r rough enough seas to where I got an airborne in my bed sleeping. And that's, never, yeah. That would, okay. 
Yeah, I got woken up and I was, my whole body was off the mattress. And I kind of softly came that, back down. That was good the shit out of me. Yeah, it was a uh, that was one of those winter fronts that roll through to kick up the golf. Oh um, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely familiar with those. So, so you you, you dug the, the offshore life, right? Mm-hmm. So, tell what was the next step in your in your career? So obviously, I mean, want to progress your career, yeah. work your way up. Um, typical role with Halliburton like that is you do the field engine role, then you become an account rep. Okay. Um, which is basically sales slash engineer. Uh, I spent some time before I still left the field, I spent some time trust, cross training in the gravel pack tools. Okay. So basically they're molding me to be an all around sand control completions okay. person. So I had the pumping side and the tool side. Okay. Moved to Houston as kind of a technical support role. And then what they, year was this? You moved to Houston. Uh, that was in 2008. Okay. I started moving. Yeah, it should have been 2008. Um, cause I was right. I was moving right when Ike hit. Is it, was that a, yeah, I think that was eight. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, cause I actually had bought, I bought a townhouse off Washington before Washington was popular. In 2008. I remember yeah. those, those Pearl Bar was there. Pearl Bar was there and actually Kung Fu Saloon was actually a, a hardware store. Yes. That was a lumber yard. It, it was Wabash. It was called Wabash? Wabash was further down. That was, was that's different. where Axis and Alibi is. Yes. Yes. Okay. But they, they used to have chickens there. Yeah. I remember that. Okay. So I had, I bought a townhouse a block behind there, just like in the neighborhood. And then like six months later, all those bars opened up taps and Blowing all that stuff opened up. Taps. Whoa. Okay. I spent a lot of time there. And, and there uh, was eight bar too. The one right next to Bricks. Bricks. Yes. Bricks is what I was thinking about. Yeah. Bricks, taps. I, I lived there for about two or three years. Hey, I dig it, man. I dig yeah. it. That's, that's back when, that's back when Washington was a different time. It was. And I, I lived two blocks away. So, you know, what can you say? I was at the bar. Yeah. B- bar working. Bar, yeah. bar, bar, oil field. So, yeah, so, so you moved back to H-Town. Oh, wait. Yeah. Moved to H-Town to become an account rep. Um, did you like, did you like the transition into sales? Yeah. I mean, it was good. Uh, so since I was an engineer by background technical, they put me in like an in-house role. Okay. So I, I initially went in-house at BP for two years doing all their deep water frack work. Okay. Um, so I was doing the sales technically, but we had, you know, we do big giant tenders and then do a you know, multi-year contract. So you're more managing that versus actual like knocking on doors and going into yeah. like, okay. I and, and I was, but I was more the in-house engineer too. Yep. Cause we, once we got the contract in place, we're like, okay, now you're the technical guy. You help them design all the completions and support, you know, do all technical support. So you're already plugged in. So you can figure, keep, keep, keep on, keep going with the project. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then offshore is a little bit different. Cause like, you know, frack jobs offshore, big gravel packs, especially deep water stuff are a big deal. Cause there's mm-hmm. so much money involved. So you'd always remote them, do these data remotes where you'd watch it real time with the customers. And a lot of times it started at two o'clock in the morning, you know, you'd be up, uh, at over office. at City West off Beltway, we had a room up there. Okay. And so I'd buy f- snacks and we'd order food and we'd basically sit up there for, you know, eight hours of time watching these jobs. All right. Um, with different customers. But that's good though. I mean, at least you're getting kind of the, the you're sitting there, you're watching the same thing, you're solving the problems, yeah. you're meeting these people and kind of getting to know them a little bit. Yeah. And I mean, there was the sales aspect because obviously we still played golf with the guys a lot. Took well, you have lunch. to. Yeah. Of course, of you know, course. It's the rough stuff. I mean, if you're if you're bringing snacks at 2 a.m., then yeah, that's the sales guy to me. Yeah, yeah. so okay. I, it was both aspects. And, and during that time, the Halliburton was trying to uh, create like a train curriculum okay. for salespeople. So I went through the training, and they, they did the scenarios with cold calls and like tried to teach all that stuff. And it was- Aren't those just- what do you think about those? It was not, it was, yeah. I don't dig those because like, look, I understand like providing people tools to mm-hmm. kind of maybe get to a con- point in a conversation. But like, if you're not yourself and you're not genuine and you're kind of doing this robotic script, you know, like, I don't think that's, to me, that doesn't, that, that doesn't create any no, trust. They were, they were hinting on the right thing though, because they were, they had this like curriculum for just calling a cold call or calling a first time customer to where you're, Supposed to ask them questions, get to know the root of their issues or their problems with their wells. It, so it was hinting on building a relationship, but it, I don't know if it's necessarily building a relationship okay. in the right direction. Okay. You know, you and I were talking about this earlier. I mean, I've been sales, I've been operator side. The first step really is to build a relationship of some kind. So I let's take a pause there because I think that's a very important thing to talk about right now. So I completely agree with you. I think that um, our industry is built off relationships. Mm-hmm. I think that's what makes our industry so special. Um, you know, I, it's, it's funny. It's like, you know, you're talking to someone's like, Oh, please, you're just playing golf with your friends. You're like, yeah, that's what makes it so great. Yeah. That's what makes this industry so great versus they're not customers. They're not clients. You know, they're customers, they're friends that are customers. So I think the relationship building side of things is so important. It's far too often people approach, uh, people, you know, operators and all mm-hmm. this stuff. And there's that targeted, 
what can you do for me yeah. conversation and go speak on that if you don't mind. No, it's, it's not what you can do for me. It's more like being there at the right time. I mean, part of that interaction relationship is you're around them frequently. Yeah. And when they think, oh, okay, I need a, for whatever, a packer. Yeah. Okay. Well, Hey, JP has a packer. I, I would just talk to him the other day and let me call him. Yeah. I know you him. Know? I know what's going on with his family. I know this guy. I know he likes this, this, that, like you have that relationship. Yeah. Especially on the small call it independent side of, of the oil fields. I mean, the big companies do these big giant tenders and procurement runs. Yes. Things. Yes. And so it's a different ball game when you're dealing with that. Um, I didn't like that experience. I had, I've had that experience on the operator side and on the service and side. And that's kind of a lack of control. I mean, you're not really controlling your project at that point. You're kind of relinquishing control and kind of giving the, uh, whatever the scraps that procurement yeah. giving you. Yeah. And, and on top of that, you know, something to note on too is it's about accountability. Um, you know, I, I spent time in house at BP in house at shell in house at marathon. And I was always requested by the customer and, you know, sought after because I always took accountability. I never, you know, say it wasn't me or it wasn't my responsibility. If something bad happens, whether it's mine or not, I would step up and say, okay, I'll, I'll help you fix it. Have you always been that way? Yeah, pretty okay. much. Yeah. Okay. I mean, uh, you know, a little antidote story. One of my dad's friends years ago, uh, back when I was probably like eight, 10 years old, made a bet with me. I think I can't remember. It was a card bet or something. And I'll, you know, a young kid, I was like, yeah. oh yeah, sure. And of course he won you know, won the trick, whatever. And he told me lesson learned, you know, never bet against the house. Basically he's like, I'm always going to win. And it was, he basically bet me and I had to go get him a beer, yeah. which was downstairs and stuff. So I was like, okay, I lost. So I went and got him a beer, but instead of getting a beer, I brought him the white chest and sat next to him. It's like, here you go. I'm done for the night. That is called, what is that? Under promising over delivering. That's what it's all about. Yeah. So man, that's sales right there. Yeah. And so I was eight years old, I think, or something. It's also problem solving. I mean, it, it, it all goes back to, Mercedes, they had the five whys, you know, when you're problem solving, what's the true root cause? Okay. And so sometimes, you know, operators, we don't know what the true root cause is, but we don't want the service company to come in and tell us about our stuff. Yeah. But once we figure it out or once we get to a certain point in the discovery, you might have the solution for the root cause. So it's just being in the right place at the right time as well. So it's, so it's, 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 it's not just, uh, it, what was I going to say when I was going off of that? It's, it's not just kind of, getting there and trying to push a, a service or a product or a piece of equipment. It's just kind of being there. Obviously, you know what I'm there for, you know, I'm selling yeah. packers and all that stuff. It's, it's just a question of, okay, well, it's building that trust with this person. Okay. Well, look, I, I need a packer. I'm going to call JP. I know this guy. Uh, I, I've talked to him. I've, yeah. I've sat with him. We've played golf. Like I know this guy. I it's, trust this guy. It's confidence and accountability. Yeah. Okay. Because, right. I mean, for one, I was saying, I know you got, I know you have a relationship with you. And as I build a relationship with you, I'll learn that you're competent and you know what you're actually talking right. about. And then accountability to be able to be there when I need you. And then, you know, it's, it's huge when something messed up in location, someone owns up to it. It means what, the world. What is, okay, so let's talk about that. What, 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 is, what is that disconnect, I guess, once person, once, when someone, I guess, sells something and all that stuff and then, uh, and I guess kind of like walks away from it. Like, you know, like, oh, I just sold, I'm, I'm, I'm going to the next one. I mean, it, it takes, it takes some accountability and, and staying in, how's staying things in going? Staying in contact. Like, yeah, what's the results? Going? Yeah. 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 I think that's important. I mean, that's, that's part of the relationship too. I mean, the relationship's not there to get you to sell. It's, it's there to kind of team y'all up as business partners so y'all can effectively achieve and, and, and drill the best well or complete yeah. the best well possible. And, and I've gotten the sales pitch that we want to be partners. Okay. That's great. But I actually need you to follow through with actions. And what's a partnership to you? I, that's, a, I mean, that's a, that's a kind of a random is. question. No, I mean, a partnership is that we are going to work together. So if I'm not trying to screw you, I don't want you trying to yes. screw me. So if basically you give me a bid and you know, it's, I think it's way out of whack and I call you and we talk, you know, man to man about I it. I dig that. That's, that's work it out and see what we can compromise. Cause I, I don't want you to lose money either. I want you to be able to run your business because you got a business. I can't use you. That is so refreshing to hear the fact that you'll actually pick up the phone, have a conversation with someone uh, versus just kind of just like, removing to the, you know, red section of your yeah. emails and just moving on. I, I, I respect that says a lot about you. I think the fact that you're actually able to pick up the phone, have these conversations and kind of, I mean, cause that helps everyone. I think, I think that even if they lose the bid, it's like, Oh, well now we know, yeah. now we know but, the market, but it takes the relationship. Cause I mean, if you're a cold call guy or, or someone I've talked to once and all you did was try and sell me a product, I'm not going to do that. Cause no. I don't know you. Exactly. I don't know where you're going to go with this, but if you build that relationship, I'll be happy to do that. If, I love that. If I know I can talk to you man to man or face to face or however you want to do it, you know, I'll do it all day long. I dig that. So, all right. So let's get back to it. So let's get back to the career. You're in, you're at Halliburton. Oh, yeah. So 
Uh, Halliburton in house. I spent two years in house BP. Where, okay. And that another side. Well, if you want to do a whole side story off to the side at some point, uh, I got sucked into the whole Macondo thing. Um, I wasn't a part of it until. Let me make that clear. Wasn't part of it until after the well blew out, and then I got sucked in to be a part of the kill teams to kill the well because um, I was high pressure from a guy in house. So do you know Ryan Wollum? Ryan Wollum. I think he was over there, uh, uh, a young guy. So we were in pods focused on different aspects. Okay. Um, I was on the top kill team originally, then the static kill. Got to hang out with the Secretary of Energy for a little bit. Okay. Um, kind of so, so you're kind of, what, three years in the old, four years? Well, I guess it wouldn't happen. Uh, uh, it was <laughs> April 20th. Yeah, about five years. It was April 20th. Was, uh, I mean, that's a pretty huge, monumental, I guess, uh, uh, experience as a, yeah, a five-year engineer. It aged me, definitely. Yeah. Um, you know, I learned a lot from that experience. Uh, you know, one point, worked 25 days straight, 16 hours a day. Um, then rolled over into more stuff for the kill wells and stuff like that. I was dealing with, uh, at one point in time, I was dealing with the VP of Gulf of Mexico for Halliburton and the operation manager of Gulf of Mexico directly, giving them updates because I got very involved in a bunch of stuff. You talk about exposure. Yeah. Um, actually, VP of the Gulf of Mexico is now the CEO of Halliburton. Okay. Uh, Jeff Miller. So All right. I, Jeff was my VP at the time. Um, That's so, crazy. And so from that, that actually rolled in. I got recruited to be a project manager within Halliburton uh, because they realized I could handle, juggle a bunch of stuff at once. Yeah. So then when I went to in-house at Marathon, I was a project manager, which makes them in-house, in-house completion engineer for the deep water. So I was supporting all services for deep water. For oh, them. okay. All right. I made a bunch of good connections there. Um, then went in-house at Shell after that. And then I hit a point in my career where I realized, you know, looking for opportunity, um, trying to figure out that next step. Do I want to continue my career with Halliburton, which Halliburton was great to me. I had a great experience there. Or do I want to look at the operator side? And I'd mentioned earlier, pretty much my next step was going to be move international or jump to an operator. Okay. And so I'd started throwing my resume out there. I'd interviewed with Marathon and Murphy. And then I was talking to an old boss at uh, Halliburton about moving to Indonesia. And then uh, the Marathon job popped up and I decided to go for that. Kind of, It worked out well because the connections I had made in-house. Yep. Um, you know, I actually interviewed a marathon. One of the managers at the time said, oh, I don't worry. I don't need, I don't need to interview him. He's good. Um, because they already knew the accountability yeah, there. The trust I spent eight there. months in house. Yeah. I'd taken accountability things. He knew, you know, my experience. What was that like uh, do, get, accepting that, uh, that offer from uh, an operator when, when you've been at the service side for so long? So I, I was more nervous about the quitting side than accepting um, because Halbert had been good to me and had a great experience there. And my manager at the time, I really liked him. Um, had a ton of respect for him. He was actually in Lafayette. I was in Houston, so we weren't even in the same city. Yeah. So I wanted to do it face to face. I'm having to do it over the phone. Right. Just because we were never in the same spot, um, time wise. But uh, I would work for the man in a heartbeat again because the first thing he told me was, you know, if that's uh, if that's the direction you want to go with your career, I fully support you. Go for it. I'll tell you one thing. The first off, leaving a company when there's nothing wrong, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like it's a great company, great people. That I've had to do that twice in my career, and it is one of the toughest conversations. It's a breakup. It's yeah. a, it's, yeah, it's it a not you. It's a me thing. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? It's a, it's a breakup, and then to have that. F- so the, the first part is yeah, it's, it's it's people say oh it's just business. Man, it's really not just business. You know what I mean? Because if you're working with these people and you really yeah. enjoy being around these people, you are severing kind of not severing, but you're you're moving on. But I really dig how. When you had these conversations, the fact that the support that you mm. got, you know, the, hey, you know, I'd love to have you here, it sounds like, uh, but, you yeah. know, you got to do this on your own. But, hey, man, you always got a spot here. Yeah. Uh, that makes it so much better. And I was being, he told me I was being groomed to be potentially his position at some point. So be the operation manager of Gulf of Mexico or some other role. Wow. Uh, the manager team in Halliburton. But like I said, it was just, and part of the decision to me, looking back, you know, I thought long and hard about it. Um, I like, I like to make decisions. I don't want to be a decision maker. Um, but part of going up the management track on the server side, it, it was going pretty quickly is I was getting away from the technical stuff, which I'm not against that, but I just knew I had a lot more to learn. Okay. So you kind of did a little a self-reflection versus a, uh, an ego driven. I want that title. Yeah. And I also wanted to know, you know, what I did to a well, actually, what, what did it do? What, how the well actually okay. performed? And you never learn that on the server side or rarely do. And so I wanted to know, you know, what I was doing, what did it really results? You know, if I make this it. decision, I want to see what, what happens. Yeah. Okay. And so jump into the operator that time as a completion engineer gave me the opportunity to 
first off, learn more of the big picture instead of just a small, you know, clump I knew from the service side. And on top of that, you know, just continue to gain my knowledge and then understand what happened. Okay, when I change up my frack design to do this or do this type of drill out, what is the end result of the well? I actually get to see it. And so you're, you're loving that side of the biz. Yeah, because, you know, I want to make things better. I want to do things more efficiently and I need to see the results at the end. And you can, sometimes you just don't catch that. So, I mean... If I have a relationship with a service guy, I'd be happy to sell, you know, share that right. experience and knowledge. But majority, you know. majority of uh, people don't. They're not going to find out how well it's performing or if this no, if you, this cause this. That's the only problem with the service side. You sell one little bitty piece of the whole big picture. Yeah. And so you don't know the end result and if it helped. Was that overwhelming to you uh, going from the, uh, the the project man for for a Halliburton thing to this bigger picture, this this macro look at the, the, the no, projects? No, I mean, that was actually one of the managers when I interviewed actually asked me that. He's like, you know, you're going to be juggling a lot of different things. I was like, well, you know, I did all the Macondo stuff. I, I juggled, you know, multiple service lines. Like I've, I've done it, Yeah. you know, it's different, but it's, it's a lot of the same at the same time. Okay. So, all right. Um, so, so it was, it was, it wasn't that big of a shift for you then? No, I'd say the only shift is that, uh, technically the job I posted for was an Eagle Ford completion engineer. When they hired me, they put me in the pocket. Okay. So South Louisiana Gulf Coast guy all of a sudden is going to North Dakota. Okay. Okay. A little bit of change. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I had been in snow, but I never, you know, driven or experienced, you know, a true winter. True, a true north winter. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and the superintendent we had up there at the time, when I was up there for one of the first big snowstorms, I asked him, I was like, you got any advice on how I'm supposed to drive? You know, anything I'm supposed to learn? Like, I'm from South Louisiana. He's like, drive slow, and he walked off. That's it? Yeah. I was like, thanks. You'll figure it out. Drive slow. Yes. You know, those bumps that you know, put on the side of the road, apparently they have real meaning up there. That's when you can hear when you're going off. Yeah. Right. They yeah. have them in the middle lane and the outside lane. So when you're the, the road is whited out, you can actually find the road. What are they called? Wake up strips or something like that? That's what we call them. Yeah. But they're, they actually have a purpose. I, yep. Trust me. I know. Yeah. I know they have a purpose. Um, so, you're, so you're going from offshore and now you're onshore. Mm -hmm. What was the biggest difference to you that you saw? Because I would I, – I've been offshore, then I went onshore, mm -hmm. and I just noticed that like the it was the it was the the cost of things. You know what I mean? Like yeah, I mean it was. I enjoy the way my career pr progressed through that because I got the very detailed technical side, engineering side of offshore, where you actually take time to yes. do the process, do yes. the studies. To onshore, bam, 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 go, go, go. But I like that because you get to see results so quickly. Okay. So it's not waiting. You know, offshore project can take Six five months, years. Yeah. You know, from the time you start playing to the time you actually execute is probably five years. And, you know, it takes, you know, months to drill, complete, and then sometimes they don't even open up the well for months. And then here in land, it's just boom, boom, boom. Yeah, I mean, it's a month. You know, you basically show up on a field and a month later it's flown well. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I did enjoy that, that the cycle time was so much faster. And so you weren't just waiting to know what you did, you know, change anything. You always got to see it. So you're up in North Dakota with Marathon, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay. So you're working the fields. You're trying to find your way around in the snow. Mm -hmm. um, how, long, how long were you up there for? So I was technically living in Houston, but we had a rotation. So I was spending two weeks every six weeks up there. Two weeks every – okay. All right. So we had a, like an engineering rotation. They want us in the field quite mm -hmm. a bit. Um, it was good. It was a great experience. I, I got burned out at one point because we weren't getting any time off. We had spent two weeks up there straight and it's come – back and go straight back in the office. Yeah. So at one point I was on the verge of getting burnt out, yeah. but then managers changed and philosophy changed. And then I was only going up there like once a quarter. Okay. Um, but about that point I'd been coming up on two and a half, three years, two years, I guess two and a half years. And they asked, you know, what's the next step of your career? I was like, you know, I'm open to whatever. I'd be interested in learning a different discipline, drilling, reservoir, you know, whatever, you know, pops up. And uh, at the time, Marathon, I learned if they take operation guys and put them in the reservoir, it was great because they understood what really was happening. The well. business side of wh why this. Well, the uh, actual operation, like the actual uh, physical act of what happens on the rig site, they understand. So, you're uh, real quick, I'm, let me back up. Sorry. So, you're talking when they, when they actually take engineers or people in operations and to the, the reservoir, reservoir yeah. because they, yeah, okay. That, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah. they understand when they go to run the business and understand the economics, they truly understand what's being put right. into the well. Right. If you're trying to get to a new well site location, what sounds easier? Take a left after the second smoke signal, hang a right after the fourth pump jack, and if you reach the third medium-sized boulder, you've gone too far. Or simply plug in the location in a trustworthy app and confidently drive in there. Oh, but JP, apps don't work on lease roads. They only get me close to location, but not exactly to the location. Hey, I know, I know, and I hear and I get you. I'm not talking about some normal civilian app. I'm talking about some game-changing technology for our industry. 
Technology is so advanced, it does what couldn't be done before, not get you lost on lease roads. WellSite Navigator is introducing the new technology that you've been asking for, lease road navigation. They've already mapped over 19,000 miles of oil field lease roads that don't appear anywhere else, and every week they are adding more. WellSite Navigator is the most trusted, it's the most downloaded oil field mobile app of all time. Founded almost 10 years ago as the first navigation app for the oil field, they helped more than 100,000 oil field hands find millions of well sites in 22 states, quickly, safely, and reliably. Most of their users come from word of mouth, so hey, help spread the word, talk to a friend. They're giving all Energy Crew listeners their first month free when you click the link in the show notes below. Plus, when you refer a friend, they get their first month free and you get a $10 Amazon card. So follow the link in our show notes to get started. Come on, make your life easier. And so I got recruited to jo- do Reservoir. And okay. So I did two years as a Reservoir engineer, the Bakken. Did you like that? Yeah, I, yes and no. I mean, it wasn't, I could tell pretty quickly it wasn't my long-term career path. Because it took you away from the, uh, you, like, you, like, from the you like the action. Yeah, I like yeah, the action. okay. Um, All right. But... It, it helped me really, I mean, I, you understand, but you don't really understand the economics and the business of a well Yeah. until you run economics on a well day in, day out. So you build type curves and you look at decline curves and you, you know, book res- reserves. But that's huge for resume building. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's, I mean, basically I learned too at Marathon time, if you wanted to become management, you need to be a reservoir engineer at some point. Okay. And so it, it was actually during the, the 16, 17 downturn is when I went to reservoir engineering. Did that for two years. And as soon as things started picking up in early 17 and operations, I was like, okay, you know, I did my two years. I'll go back. I'll jump back in, which I did. I jumped back in for Bach and, and we went from, what was it one, zero frack crews and one drilling rig to 10 rigs and five frack crews in two months. Two. Okay. All right. That's, that's pretty, impressive. Yeah. Pretty, pretty good. Pretty impressive. All yeah. Right. That year alone, we, I think we took the, the marathon Bakken production from like 35,000 barrels a day to like 75,000 barrels a day. And this was in 2016? 2017. 2017. Yeah. Okay. All right. But I did like six months back in operations completions. And at that time, then marathon had just bought their Permian acreage. Okay. And so I uh, volunteered, applied to jump into the Permian group. And then I was the first uh, completion engineer for their permanent group for their acres they have at the Delaware Basin. So it seems like you're the first in a couple things in your career, you know, whether it's the first offshore, it's the first permian. Like, well, is this something that you're, that you're, that you want to be the forefront? Hey, look, put me there. Or is it just kind of one of those things that it's like, it's been luck, luck or chance? Not, not luck, but it's kind of the conversation we were having earlier that, you know, it's uh, not m- passing up an opportunity, you know, it, <laughs> So I think let's, let's, let's get back. Let's get on that conversation real quick. Um, so before we, we started um, uh, recording this, Hank and I were talking about kind of uh, the old model. And the model is what? Five year, 10 year, 15 year plan. We're going to see yourself in five yeah. years. Yeah, exactly. And, and you had a great, you had such a great way of kind of uh, looking at that and kind of, kind of deconstructing and kind of uh, providing more of a, re- not just don't think five years out, you know what I mean? Something might happen to you. And, and so, so yeah. speak to that. Yeah, I mean, something can happen to you in, in two weeks. Um, you know, something that I learned early on in my career with Halliburton, because I think I was at Halliburton for seven years and I had four or five different job titles. Okay. You know, uh, learned that pretty early on. You don't pass up an opportunity. Yeah. You know, the world is so dynamic nowadays. You don't ever, you can't plan five years. I, yeah. I don't know if you can, you can barely plan maybe a year, two years if yeah. you're lucky. Yeah. I mean, especially with the company I'm at now, we're a small company. We react quickly. So yeah. things are always changing, which isn't a bad thing. It's good to be quick to reaction. Um, but you have to realize that you can't say, okay, five years from now, I'm going to be a manager. I'm going to be an engineer. I'm going to do this. Because you have no idea. No, and you don't know where the opportunities are going to, are going to preside. So as soon as an opportunity pops up, you got to take advantage of it. And so that's the kind of philosophy I've gone with. I mean, I, I volunteered to be, you know, when I was with Halbert still in Lafayette, I was a volunteer to be the first one to, to do a cross training with the tools. Okay. And they wanted me to like build a training program off of that. And I kind of, you know, was leading, identifying, you know, how we should be trained for that. And then once I jumped to Houston, you know, went in house, um, then I was pretty young to jump into that project management. Yeah. Group. But after the Macondo thing, they recruited me and said, you want to do this? I was like, yeah, I'll do that. And I'd been looking at a couple of different other roles in Halliburton, but that one was the most promising. And then the marathon thing, like I said, I was looking at the next opportunity. Was it international with a Halliburton or was it going to an operator? And so I looked, you know, did a couple of interviews, looked at a couple of different angles, you know, decided this was the best opportunity to take, took it. Uh, opportunity to jump into reservoir engineer after a couple of years, you know, I basically said, sure, I'd be willing to, you know, 
do some of the cross training. So a lot of times people in their career, they think of opportunity. So like they'll think their path. Okay. I want to be VP of X, Y, Z yeah. in five years. You know what I mean? And there's a lot of times you call them opportunities, um, whether they're opportunities, hurdles, uh, changes in changes in path or whatever that looks like. That's not on the direct course that you imagined. Mm -hmm. What, you know, my course should be this, this, and this, I'm going to work my way up this, 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 and this, and then I want this. So to you, opportunities are kind of things that present themselves that, it, that may feel uncomfortable, that may feel, ah, this is out of my realm, I'm not really sure. So kind of what, when you say don't pass up opportunity, um, are, is, is that like a gut feeling for you or is it just kind of ways in the pros and cons, the potentials? I mean, for me, it's, it's always, I've been able to identify it by kind of my work ethic in a way because okay. I've noticed certain spots in my career when I'm about, two years in, if it's kind of been doing the same thing, I feel like I'm getting kind of lazy and repetitive. I can feel myself just not looking forward to what I'm doing. Okay. And that's when I realize I need a new opportunity because I'm just not being challenged is what right. it comes down to it. I mean, you do two, three years in a position and you're just not, and you get in a, a cycle and, you know, you're still looking to improve, you know, what you're doing day to day, but you, you just get repetitive and it just gets boring. And those are the points in my career where I realize, okay, I need to do something different. And so that's when I, so I'm always keeping an eye out for an opportunity, but those are the specific times I'm like, okay, you know, I need to find a new opportunity. Do you feel that your opportunities or the, the, the ability to make those strategic decisions or like, eh, I'm kind of bored right now. The higher you get, the more you can kind of like play with, I guess, your board. I'm like, you know what? I think we can kind of optimize this. We, we can look at this. Like you have more power and I guess more of an umbrella to kind of uh, impact. Yes, because it goes with experience. Because the more diverse experience you have, the more, you know, knobs you're, you're able to twist yeah. and understand and tweak and optimize. Right. And so the more diverse experience you got, the, the different angles you can go or you can get more involved in different things. I mean, where I am now with Lime Rock, you know, I joined, you know, I, I had several buddies who went bigger, smaller companies. And I, I liked the idea of it just because, you know, less politics and just. At I, smaller companies. Yeah. Yeah. And besides that, I want to be in control more. Just my natural thing is I want to be the one in control of doing things. Yeah. And so, you know, operations manager, I'm, I'm primarily over completions and, you know, major work over operations, but it cracks me every time I get a sales call guy saying, hey, can I get a contact for your procurement department? Okay, you're talking to them. I mean, you know, there's no procurement department. Yeah. So some days I'm dealing with contracts, some days I'm dealing with invoices, uh, you and know, you like that though. You, you, you like the, you like the smaller, uh, environment. Well, that goes to keeping me challenged yeah. because I'm continuously doing something different, you know, every day of the week, you know, I've got a frag job going on right now. You know, my focus is on the frag job, but I've also got a vertical well operation on all, you know, well in West Texas and I've got a frag job going on in Barnett. Um, I've got three workover rigs running in North Dakota. You know, so there's a, there's a lot of things you can kind of put your attention and effort to that yeah. kind of can diversify and keeps me your work. Yes, yeah. yes. I mean, we're in the process of buying some new stuff. And so we've got new stuff we'll be onboarding in the next few months, new acreage. Um, and so that keeps the challenge going. And so it keeps me from getting bored. Right. Right. So let's, let's, I, so you, so you went over to, uh, so at Mar so get, so get me there. So tell me how you made the jump from, uh, yeah. Um, so I, I started looking outside Marathon for multiple reasons. Um, so, you know, a lot of reasons, personal reasons. Sure. And I started interviewing, started actually putting my resume out there a little bit, talked to a couple of different companies, looking primarily smaller. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and what role are you looking for at this point? Because uh, you have experience a lot. Yeah. To be honest, I was open to any, you know, okay. I, primarily I would prefer operations, but if something with a reservoir background or something, just get a foot in the door at the right company, I was open to. Okay. Um, I interviewed several different companies. Lime Rock was actually kind of interesting. Uh, primarily, we reach out when we're looking to hire, we reach out to people who know people. You know, we're a small company. We want to make sure you fit within the company. So usually when we're looking to hire, we, we interview people who know people first. So culture is huge at Lime Rock. Yeah. Okay. All right. Very much. Um, I'm one of the people that didn't know anybody. And I, a recruiter actually found me on LinkedIn of all places. Okay. Which is very unusual. Um, and this is in 2018. Yes. Yeah. I don't, I don't think people use LinkedIn. And I didn't. I know. I, I, I just started using during COVID. I think I, I had signed up for it, I think that year because I was starting to look around and, you know, thought it'd be good. It was kind of a dead, out. it was kind of a dead professional social website for a long time. I mean, I had yeah. an account for a long time. I just never used it. Yeah, exactly. And, um, 
recruiter sent me a message and said, would you be interested? And I replied back, sure, depends on the company and, you know, what the position is. And she actually responded back later on. She's like, oh, I actually just looked at your profile and realized you're actually an absolute perfect fit for this role. I really need to talk to you. Can I call you? So she reached out to you first. So she had sent a blanket, you know, response to a bunch of different people. And then when she went back and actually looked at my She realized, like, oh, I actually got one. I actually got a good one. Yeah. Okay. All right. And so that was a Friday. I talked to her on the phone. Um, my wife and I were actually leaving for a vacation, our first vacation away from our, our newborn. Okay. Uh, that next week, um, just a quick trip to Mexico for a couple of days, just to get away. And uh, I actually went and met my now boss for breakfast downtown at like 6 a.m. on okay. Tuesday. Where'd y'all um, go downtown? We just went to the hotel across the street from the Shoot. office. Okay. Uh, it used to be a double tree and now it's something else. Okay. Um, All right. I had a noon flight that day. So really I just met him that morning. I went home, helped my wife finish packing and we went to the airport. Okay. And then I got a message from her, I think within a day or two later, like, Hey, we want to bring you back for a second interview to meet the CEO and the, and the president of the company or CEO at the time. And so I think I came back a week. So let's see, that's Tuesday, the following Friday. Okay. So I was in Mexico that Friday, the following Friday, I went and met them on Friday. Um, did, I guess you call it a second interview. They had the offer for me on the following Tuesday and Whoa. I, and I put in my two weeks, I think that day. So the whole process took two weeks. And so, so, le so leaving, I guess this, this big established company and, and, and going to a company, uh, Lime Rock, I mean, for you, I mean, was that kind of a, a how was, how was that decision for you? It, it really wasn't that hard. Cause I'd been looking. And then once I, you know, obviously started doing my research in the Lime Rock and realized that yes, they were a small private equity company, but they really weren't. I mean, they're, they're pretty well established. Yes, They've they been around are. since 2005. Um, you know, if you look at our, our management, especially our CEO now, CEO now, Eric, he's very, very well known. He's on the board of Conoco, board of Valero, um, board of Baylor hospital. Uh, and then the way they do their business, they're very well known throughout the industry. And so once I started looking at that, I was like, okay, this is actually a perfect opportunity. They got a good reputation. They're involved. They're, yeah, they're, yeah I dig that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, they're a very strong company. And then the position I interviewed for was they called it, I mean, cause we, they don't, a small, we're still a small company, yeah. so titles don't really necessarily mean all that much, but was area engineer for North Dakota. Okay. So basically I was going to, I was coming in to run there. I was basically going to be like an assistant ops manager for North Dakota. Okay. I, I, when I hired on, I was running the drilling completion and work over operations for North Dakota, just the North Dakota field. Cause that was the biggest field they had. And so I came in did that. I was technically that title, I guess, 18 through 19. Yes. And then as we started to acquire stuff and start growing a little bit and personnel changed a little bit, and they got to know me. Um, basically, the end of 19, beginning of 20, I promoted to ops manager and then got put over all completions and work over major work over operations for everything. So let's talk about that real quick. So you're the area, North Dakota area manager. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then January 2020, you get, uh, you get a uh, promotion or a, new, or a new position, operations manager. Yeah. And world shuts down in February, a month after that. Tell me about that. Tell me about, I guess, stepping on that new role. Now you're in a management role. Now the, the world's changing. So, I mean, I guess, yeah. how, how did you keep your team, I guess, kind of uh, 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 motivated or whatever, whatever it is, in, lo in line? Or how did you, get, how'd you uh, keep them, uh, the team mentality? Yeah, I mean, it, obviously, the team mentality is difficult because, uh, you know, we, we weren't seeing each other. Right. Didn't see each other for a year. I saw bits and pieces. Right. We, we attempted to come back in office at one point in 2020 and then we were back in office part-time for like a month and we went back home. Um, I think it was 13, 14 months total. We were home and then we were back in office part-time and then full-time. Okay. I mean, obviously I spent tons and tons of time on the phone. Yeah. Um, between just normal conference calls uh, to just touch and base with people. I would, I started doing, I think, uh, I think I had a weekly call just with everyone who reported to me just to touch base and okay. go through and see what you're doing, what was going on. Um, it was, I mean, it was definitely an interesting time. I mean, I was already managing some people as the area engineer. I got a few more people as the operations manager and definitely a lot more areas. Right. And so some of the areas I was trying to learn about them during the transition and, you know, I got put over the completions and the major work over stuff for West Texas. And then I didn't see the field for the first, you know, January, 2020, I was put over that and I didn't see the field for the first time until a month ago, really? two months ago. But uh, the guys out in the field, I was talking to, you know, almost every day. So you know what's going on. I mean, you, yeah. you're figuring out what's going on as much as you can without, without being unable to go to the field. Yeah. And so, and, and, you know, we're, as I mentioned, we're very quick to react. So what was it? Uh, 
March or May, whenever things got really bad. Yeah. You know, we shut in, I don't know, something like 80% of our oil production for the whole month. Uh, wow. which is March or May, whichever the M one March, March, March is when May uh, is May. shit shut down. May is when it was yeah. bad. May is when oil prices dropped in the negatives. Yes. So we were literally just shut in wells because we okay. were hedged and we're like, it, it doesn't pay. We're losing money to produce them. So we just shut them in. Okay. And at the time, uh, with us all being from home, my president asked me to basically build a backlog tracking spreadsheet. He wanted me to start tracking all of our wells that had gone down. Um, and then start tracking basically with their economic to put back online. Okay. With their, whatever the whole price though. was. And so I spent most of the time at home building this giant mega spreadsheet with, you know, regulatory uh, issues, notes, you know, when did the well go down? What was it supposed to produce? How much is it going to cost to fix it? Is it economic? Is it, we're basically shot for Talk like Talk about a month. snapshot. Yeah, so I spent basically every day in that spreadsheet updating it because, you know, as when we brought production back online in April, we, we brought it up slowly over different areas. And, you know, most of those artificial lift systems out there are made to produce or made to run. Mm -hmm. When you shut them down like that, they break. And so we had tons of failures, but then we had to really look at every single well and is it worthwhile, you know, bring that back online? Will it make us money? If it won't, leave it down. Right. And if it's a... Uh, leasehold issue then you know we maybe need to consider even though it won't necessarily make money but we don't want to lose the lease is the lease yeah. worth it so we had a lot of those conversations a, those, those are a bunch of interesting conversations man yeah and so we basically had you know a meeting twice a week as a bigger group we'd go through the wells you know talk about what's what we're focused on what we're going to get done um you know and so i had to it wasn't as busy as we were but you know i had all my engineers focused on optimization and, and you know and uh we basically building, you know, different tools to optimize, you know, uh, do these wells make us money? If they don't, you know, can we release them? Should we just, you know, because we have an older field in West Texas and sometimes it's, it's more economic just to call it good. Just okay. leave the well. Okay. Um, and so we did a bunch of stuff like that as well as looking at different optimization systems for artificial lift, looking at the problem wells. And then as oil started to recover a little bit and not all the way back to us now, you know, we started looking at like lateral cleanouts. Where can we get uplift on production? You know, different things like that. So it's definitely a challenge to keep people engaged, but we, we generated projects to focus on that, you know, that we knew would add value once things came back. So and you're pretty much planning for when things get back. Hey, let's, let's, let's be the best run Lime Rock yet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so we were putting, I don't know, the basically processes or different yeah. things in place that we knew we could utilize as things got busy again. And so it's, it's going to be difficult as we ramp up and get busy on, you know, major operations, not to focus on those little things. So that's going to be the challenge to me for this next year is we did some really good things focusing on the small details this past year. I don't want to lose sight of that as we get so busy. Bring your scope bigger. Yeah. Okay. What, what have you seen from, on the, I guess, uh, you know, you, you get your position uh, in January, the industry changes, the world changes. Um, pretty much there's, there's companies that are out, there's people shifting, there's people, your old contacts, because you know, you're, you know, a lot of people, your old contacts are kind of fragmented. And if you're not caught, I mean, you're obviously focused on your team. So I guess the, uh, the current events of a lot of people wasn't going on. What did you see kind of uh, change, I guess, on the service side um, during the, uh, during the, uh, whatever, from June, January, 2020 until, until now, I guess, coming out. I mean, like you said, there's consolidation. I mean, a lot of the vendors out there that you typically use may not exist or yeah. got bought up by somebody. Um, there's consolidation of companies or consolidation of personnel. There's a lot of the people who know people all went to work for one company versus yeah. another one. And so all your contacts at this company are gone. Um, so there is a lot of, you know, what you're trying to do with the energy crew that needs to be done because there are disconnects now. Yeah. And so, I mean, obviously we're calling people know the operators, hey, you got a contact for this person or, you know, this person because – it is difficult to make those connections um, when you don't know where anybody is anymore. And that's, dude, that's honestly the point. Like the point of like this, 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 this club crew or crew club, whatever it's going to be called. Like I, I remember, you know, in my previous company sitting down and you had all these operators at the table, you know, some knew each other, maybe they might have worked before, some didn't and all that stuff. And the best thing you can do is honestly just like, just the best thing that I saw, which is everyone just start talking. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, wow, I've tried this before and this actually doesn't work in this uh, area or whatever. You start seeing these. And that's what we need knowledge share in the industry. We need relationships being built in the industry. And that's the whole purpose of this thing, because a lot of that is lost. Yeah. You know, and that's something I've tried to bring to my current position at Lime Rock, because before I was there, they used to just operate kind of 
solo in their different acreages because you know we operate within different funds and different so mm -hmm. it, as you purchase an acreage a lot of times you have a, someone just focus on this aspect and not the whole big picture so i tried to bring you know cross knowledge across the different basins because there's something that works in north dakota that may work in west texas yeah. it may not but it may work and so a lot of times i basically you know put guys in touch with each other have had meetings to say hey let's talk about this and see what benefit there is but it's the same thing on the service side operator side we can always learn from each other um, but at the same time though, it's, it's the relationships. Cause a lot of times if I had a guy at this company, someone I, I trust, someone I knew was accountable, why well, I want to deal with him. It not necessarily has to do with the company. So then I'm looking to figure out where he maybe went or they so that, went. That's what I was going to ask you. I mean, that's, that's a great. Yeah, I was going to say, so let's say that person does leave and all that stuff. It, is that, is that relationship with that company or is it with that person? It, it's both. I mean, some people just have like a, a great technology quality assurance, you know, yeah. you know, they're going to be repeatable. Yeah. But even that's being pushed to limits right now with all the service companies because I, I know, you know, labor issues, hiring, you know, people are trying to ramp up. There's really no companies. Um, I mean, there's no truck drivers. People left the industry. Yes. Uh, Amazon hired everybody, it seems yeah. like. And so even some of the companies that I knew, hey, like this product I like, it's being pushed a little bit, you know. Is it really still that quality? Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And so it, it's almost a whole learning experience. You almost have to start from the drawing board on some stuff. Like, okay, I need to kind of revet the companies, but if I'm going to do that, I prefer to revet it with someone who I already know who you trust. have a relationship with. So what? what, what, what so the challenges in our industry right now, obviously, you just brought one up, which is labor. Obviously, you know, getting people, whether it's you know. Uh, uh, shit anywhere from engineers to pumpers you know what i mean it's, it's there is a labor issue there is hesitancy to to not only work in our industry but also to invest yeah. in our industry right now mm -hmm. and so i guess where do you see i guess um the tipping point when solutions start coming in versus more challenges that is a great question here at energy crew sponsored by connection group well not the podcast but that question the uh <laughs> Challenges and solutions. I mean, I mean, daily basis we're dealing with challenges and trying to find solutions. Right. But where does it? Well, look, I guess, I guess, I guess the thing. I guess the thing is though, it's like you know, like it's you know, you look at commodity prices right now. Mm -hmm. They're pretty good, pretty yeah. good from a couple yeah. months ago. Um, obviously, people need to operate within their cash flow, get their balance sheet rights, and you get the investments and all stuff. So, I guess when do you see this industry not being such a um, a storm to operate in, if that makes sense? So, it's it really is when the banks get comfortable with the industry. Okay, what's going to cause that? Stability, really. Okay. I, I mean, I see it every day. You know with what we're dealing with, but. I came to the energy forums and listened to the uh, Pioneer CEO talk, and yep. he basically said the same thing, is that we're out of favor with investment firms or the banks because over the last 10 years, there's been so many downturns. And so until we see, you know, probably potentially two years of stability to the industry and, and stability in price, you'll still have your, your investors who have always invested, but yeah. to get that new interest in it. Because it, a, it a, be, a lot of investment is left. Yeah, you know they 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 they're deeming us as a t tobacco or something like that. Yeah. So it's it's kind of a a dirty investment for them. But 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 it's not. It, it, yes, there's that perception, but it's not. I mean, the truth is, if and you know, I've I've talked to I've got a cousin who who's a VP for Merrill Lynch, and yeah. you know, I've talked to him before. You know, last political elections and stuff like that. And he said, when it comes to the money world, they really don't care. You know, they're in to make money. Yeah. They might say, yeah, people might say, oh, yeah, well, we want this, we want this. But at the end of the day, you're right. If it, if it generates If it generates money, money they can, they can find a way. They're in. Yeah. And so, I, unfortunately, I mean, I hope there's some stability mm. and that we see, you know, a, a set oil price or a range of right. a solid oil price for a couple of years. And I think that's when you'll have the big investments come back. But I, I think it's, I mean, you, I've talked to guys that still in Marathon and other places and publicly traded companies and they're going to stay flat in their operations. They're not going to ramp up much because um, I mean, obviously staying within cash flows and making the banks happy. Yeah, yeah. Basically the banks want, you, the banks don't want you to build up the debt like we built previously when we ramp up really fast. It's got to be pretty, I guess, I mean, I guess with all the merged acquisitions and synergies, it's got to be pretty, I guess. Uh, and that's another thing too, man. Like, I, you know, people are like, you know, break, make the whole field fun again, make this and fun again. Like, but like, the overall air, I can only imagine at a public company, I guess, uh, you know, the spirit, the vibe, the energy, whatever you want to call it. It's got to be pretty, I guess, every day is like, shit, what now? Yeah. What now? What am I going to face with now? It's out of my control. Yeah. And then people who say that just don't realize, I mean, it, it's all run by money. 
And if the money is not there, the oil field is not going to be the old fun oil field. I mean, it's still going to be a good industry, but it's going to take it's going to take a couple of years to heal. Yeah, it really is. It's and then, not going to should be, it should heal. Yeah, I mean, we we've done a poor job in the past of of operating our industry yeah. like a like a like but, a business. But you know, people your age, my age, you know, or younger in the industry, they've only been a part of the last three cycles. So that what it was, was a cycle two thousand seven two thousand eight. And yes. that one like bounced back in like months. And then there was one in 15 to 17. 16, which was uh, like a year and a half downturn. But it, when it came back, it came back really strong yes. pretty quickly. Yeah. I think we've been lucky. I think this is more like the late 80s downturn right now. It's going to heal, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to be slow. It's going to be a longer time. Yeah. And then that, might, that might stop those peaks and valleys. So Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what we need it to do is, you know, equalize and stabilize. But there's not going to be, I mean, what I think. Part of the reason for the 07, 08 downturn is because 2005, 2006, the oil field was hiring and growing like crazy. And they just overextended themselves and, and grew too fast. And then it slowed down a little bit. Then they went back doing it to again. And we don't learn. We don't. And I understand because we want, we, I mean, it goes back to money. We want to make money. Yep. Yep. Um, but without the, you know, big money investments, it's going to be a slow recovery. Are you optimistic about our industry right now? Yeah. I mean, we're not going anywhere. Yeah. I mean, it's, I don't know what you. I mean, we are going somewhere in 30, 40 years. But, but not, not no, I mean, short term, you're, not, you're, you're more optimistic than anything. Yeah, I, I'm optimistic because I think it, stabilization could be a good thing. Yes. Um, especially if it takes a couple of years, maybe people do slow down a little bit and not go crazy. But it, it is going to be a different. I mean, people just accept it's not, I mean, you know, like you said, the old field of the 80s, the old field of the 70s, old field of the 60s. I mean, it, it, it changes quite often. Yeah. And it's never quite the same again. It is what it is. That's just the way of the world. I think you're seeing more um, um, financial discipline this turnaround. Mm -hmm. I think you're seeing more uh, planning, yeah. you know, versus going out there and just kind of punching a hole. Um, I think you're seeing a lot more people wearing different hats. You know, I think there's I think there's been a lot of people that have left the industry and companies aren't mm -hmm. hiring. So a lot of people are getting a lot of exposure yeah. in different areas and all that stuff. So Which is good. I mean, if, if you want to be in the oil field, you just got to ride it out and you'll be I think you'll be great a couple of years down the road. But you just got to ride it out. It's right. going to last a couple more years. I mean, the you know, the, the saying the only constant in the universe is change. change. Yeah. How do you handle change? Just does, do. Does it, does it, does just it do. Give, so it doesn't give you any anxiety or anything like nah. that? No. I mean, you'll learn. I'm pretty. Well, there's. Some, I mean, kill. there's some people when the, when it's a, a change. There's all, there's often a lot of anxiety. You know, da, 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 all that stuff. I mean, I, I've always been pretty even keel. But as I mentioned, when I dealt with the Macondo stuff and was sitting next to the Secretary of Energy at one yeah. point, I will never have that level of stress in my life ever again. From a professional standpoint, you already got out of the way. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good. I mean, yeah. The, the stress I felt in that, from a professional standpoint, <laughs> will never happen again and be impossible. I mean, so now, any, now anything that comes your way, it's like, eh, eh okay, I'll just, yeah, I'll, I'll deal we'll, with it. We'll figure it out. Yeah. I'll deal with it. Yeah. So what, what else do you do? Where about town do you, do you live at? You in a... I'm Spring Branch, West Side Energy Corridor. Oh, yeah, okay. So right. I'm, I'm off I-10, State Center area. Yeah, okay. So what, what, do, what do you do in your, uh, in your free time? I mean, I guess when you're not always, when you're not updating that spreadsheet. Uh, right now, it's pretty much focused. I got a three-year-old, so he pretty much takes up all the free time. How's um, that going? Exhausting. It is. Man, the energy level. Um, yeah, he's he's great. He's awesome. He's exhausting. It's amazing. Whenever I feel like whenever uh, you know, the adult is either sick or hungover, it's like that they there's like a there's a sixth sense where they're like, Oh, now I'm gonna start being more have more energy. I'm gonna I'm gonna spread some stuff on the walls and I'm gonna yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be worse today because I know they're feeling bad. Yeah. No, it's I mean it's funny, I think about it all the time. Uh, you know, throughout the whole summer, I usually mow the grass in the middle of the afternoon on Saturdays. Okay hottest time worst time to mow it but that's when he's napping oh okay you know all right because if not i, I see him beating the window wanting to come out while i'm mowing the grass and it's like well why am i taking time away from him so i'll just go sweat you know? so, so you i mean so if, if it's time off away from work you're spending time with your family yeah i dig that yeah. I'm, I'm kind of the same way man so my daughter splits uh homes between um her you know her mother's home and our home and mm -hmm. it's just like when it's evelyn it's just us you yeah. know what i mean like very rarely do i do something when, when we have a daughter it's always it's always just us. it's always family time no, I'm excited. I mean, obviously, he's getting to that super fun age. He, uh, we built the pool two years ago. He's figured out how to swim this summer. Huge during COVID. Yeah. Dude. Oh, yeah, it was, it was clutch. We built in 2019. Ooh. And so 2020, it was great. We would be in the pool three times a day. That you know? is, I'll, t I'll tell you one thing. Pools were a, uh, a luxury uh, friend to have, I guess, during COVID. Like, it's yeah. just, 
We, we literally finished it in May of 19. Ooh, that's good timing. Yeah. That's good timing time. right there. And so he, you know, any chance he gets, he wants to go swim. And so, and, uh, our, yeah, he wants to battle. He wants to play this, wants to do puzzles, wants to build robots. You know, it's. So what's his favorite show right now? Oh God. The uh, Paw Patrol? Octonauts? It, it changes like a weekly. Okay. It really changes weekly. This past weekend, and he, his favorite thing is he wants to pick one. So we pull up Netflix and he just makes us scroll until he sees a picture he thinks is cool. And this past weekend, he found a show called Goo Jiu Jitsu. Okay. It's a five episode show from 2019. Okay. It's actually pretty funny. It's just like, yeah, you check it out. And he was, this past weekend, he became obsessed with it all of a sudden. Now he thinks he can do like Goo Jiu Jitsu. So he wants to battle me and. That's pretty funny though. I like that though. I mean, you got to scrap with him. Oh yeah, yeah. So I, when I was his age or a little bit older, I gave my dad black eyes on accident because I like to do the same thing. And that's, it's common. So if you see me with a black eye one day, it's probably because my three-year-old actually sure, kicked me. Sure, sure. The yeah. three-year-old, if, if you need to talk, you, <laughs> we can talk off, 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 off of this. Okay. Sorry, Jessica. <laughs> Just joking. That's my wife. She, so, yeah. She's great. I, I, figured, I figured that was your yeah, wife. Yeah. Um, no, no, it's great. Uh, like I said, yeah, work, go straight home. Playtime, dinner time, bath time, so bedtime. Evelyn, Evelyn's at the age now where she started. So like, like we'll play video games. You know what yeah. I mean? Like she'll play uh, Roblox. We'll do. You know, my wife has beaten Zelda like three times. Mm -hmm. You know, Witcher three, and I'll do Halo. So now it's like a little gaming family. Okay. So it's kind of cool at that yeah. age we can start doing that. Yeah, he wants to help too with everything. So it was just pretty cool. Like, uh, you know, home for the storm the other day. My wife was baking cookies, and he wants to roll it. And he wants to make the cookies. Okay, he helped me. You know, a month or so ago, I was making ribs. He helped me, like, wipe down the ribs. Nice, so free, nice. You know, so he actually, if he sees us doing something on the kitchen counter, he drags a chair to the dining room because he wants to get up and help. Is he going to be in the oil field? I don't know, to be honest. Um, you know, our, our kid's generation, I, I don't know. I'm not against him if he wants to be. I just don't know if, you know, the What's way the there? world's going. Yeah. Yeah. It's still going to be there, but I just don't know if it's going to be – you know, you got to get a is. picture with him at a, do you have a picture with him at a, a site yet? A location? No, no, you got to get that. Like you got yours. I have to think about where I can, well, I have to think about, it. I can, I can get one. You'll do any traveling coming up or anything? Um, we're planning on it. We were supposed to go to Florida this past weekend, but we decided to cancel it just with COVID and Florida. Yeah. We're, we're supposed to go. My wife went to the university of Florida. I went to Alabama. Okay. They're playing each other this weekend. We're oh. supposed to go to the game. Just didn't feel comfortable being around 90,000 people. Yeah. Um, yeah. Give them another year. Yeah. So we're going to wait. Um, we do, let's see, what do we, what do we have coming up? We have a trip in October for uh, one of my best friends high school's surprise birthday, 40th birthday, to Amelia Island. Okay. When is this? Uh, I have to look at dates. Now October. I got to release this after. You know that, right? Because <laughs> you know they're going to be listening. He's a doctor. Oh, he, he's a He's the number one fan of, he's the second number he's one fan of energy. He's a neuropediatric radiologist. That is literally 40% of the people that yeah. listen to this. Neuropedia. Well, if, you, if this blows his surprise, then, then I'll that take means, the blame. That means he's a, an avid listener. Yeah. So it's a compliment to me. Okay. I'll take that. Um, I know we have some other trips. I'm trying to think what else. I think we're going to do an anniversary trip. We went to, uh, it was during COVID, but we, we went to Deer Valley last, our anniversary is in November. Okay. Uh, Utah, Deer Valley. Okay. To, uh, to one of the St. Regis Resort. And we went last year. It was off season, so there's no one there. Dig that. And I think we're going to go again this year. So y'all still kind of, you, you, you're still kind of like, look, you know, COVID's not over. So we're just still going to kind of, we're, we're going to get out. We're going to get about. We're going to meet people and all that stuff. But we're not going to put ourselves in a stadium for 90,000 people. No, no. I mean, yeah, we're being careful. We're, I mean, we're vaccinated. Mean, we're masking up. I mean, we're willing to travel, but we're being very as careful as we can about so you, it. So you're still getting out and about, but you're still just being cautious we are and we're watching it i mean yeah. if, if we're anywhere we plan to go if it if we see you know a spike or something going on i mean we'll probably cancel and rebook or do something but i mean yeah we're no, keeping no. up with the news or you know keeping up with the facts staying smart about it and you That's know, only still trying to right live now. live life to a certain extent i mean we're not we're not going crazy um you know most of the time if we eat out we just we order it and take it home you know dude first off couch yeah can, yeah couch Trust me, I'm, I'm I'm picking up. I dig that. I dig the whole uh, house thing. So, have you been to any of the the, the conferences, the Urtech, the, uh, the the Nape, the the Doug, or anything like that? No, I mean we. I went. There was a little refract conference I went to 
at uh, Hotel Derrick about a month ago. Okay. It was a small conference, just on, on refracts. I went to it for a day, day and a half. How was that? Um, was, was the turnout good? I mean, yeah, it's pretty good. And okay. actually, I, it was good. I mean, they, they did temperature checks at the door. Um, you know, I thought, and they spaced everyone out. Okay. It was all tables and they had everyone spaced out. I'm pretty much just sat around the people from my office. So it was, it was good. I mean, I haven't been to any big ones. Our company was supposed to do a, a big NAPE happy hour and they ended up canceling it. Um, which I understand. A, a, a lot of companies did. I mean, yeah. yeah I mean, which is one thing being in a big open area around people versus being in a crowded bar. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. Um, so, uh, what else, what else you got for me right now? We're coming up on an hour and 15 minutes. Oh, wow. I know. Right. I guess time flies when you're having fun. Okay. <laughs> All right. Or when there's ring lights on. Yeah. Right? I know it, it does kind of heat up. So what else, what, what else you got to do? What, what, do you have any like mess, like thoughts, like uh, conversations you've had with your buddies? That's like, you know, it's kind of a, I like to bring this up. No, I mean, obviously, I mean, I think things are going to be, you know, recover some next year. I mean, we're looking at being more active. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, things will be better. It's just going to be slower than we think. You know, I've talked to some guys at service companies who started to ramp up and realize it's not happening that fast. Um, you know, operators, I think, you know, I'm sure you've read this, the articles that private equity is going to be the one to go more active next year and yep. probably public companies. Um, it's probably going to be the same for us. We're still figuring out exactly what that means. Maybe by the time we do our breakfast run, I'll have more information by then. Which is coming up. Um, cause things change on a daily basis, Maybe. hourly basis sometimes for us. And so, it, you know, it, everything's looking better. I, I can't tell you where it's going to be yet next year, but it's going to be better. Just control today, control your environment today and just yeah. make the best of it. I mean, yeah. it's everything else is out of your control. Yeah. Basically. So Cody going over to Tejas. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. I think that's a great move. Yeah. I, 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 I mean, love me some TJ. Cody and I know each other from Halliburton. So we've known each other since, I don't know. Oh, something. Yeah, I saw that. What, he make it this week or something like that? He went over there? Yeah, I'm yeah. Pumped, man. I, I'm digging what TJ is doing, man. I, 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 love, I love that guy. And, and what he's doing, following his dream, building that, getting some good people, man. I, I, I love that guy. So Yeah, and, and Cody and I, I mean, I knew about it before the announcement because he and I talked and he gave me a heads up and we, we talked about the opportunity. And I, yeah, it's great for him. I mean, it's, it really is. I know he's been looking for the right opportunity for a while now. You know, he finished up his MBA and he's – Oh, you know, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. Cody did his MBA. Um, of course, A&M, you know, if you know Cody, he's huge Aggie. Uh, nothing, you know, it's yeah, still buddy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just that one week in a year, we don't talk. Um, but yeah, he finished up his MBA and I mean, kind of like the same thing TJ did, you know, did his MBA and realized they want to, you know, take that next step and they I did it, it, which is good for them. And I, th I really think the timing is going to be great for them. I mean, it's not going to be a instant overtaining, you know, overnight success, but I think they're building the next something. Year, they're yeah. Building over the next something. year, I think it's a perfect time to build it. I dig it. I, I love these people right now kind of stepping out and doing their own thing. Like, honestly, like, it's, 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 shit, I, I'm 41. I just started my own thing. It's, it's a lot of anxiety, a lot of self doubt, a lot of, uh, a lot of, should I really be stepping on the ledge? So for people to actually do that and be successful, like, like, you know, like, you know, TA yeah. and Cody now going over to build that team, like, hats off to them and, and everyone else out there kind of that's decided to pursue their passion. Well, and, and, you know, be honest, talking to Cody, I think, my perception is they feel comfortable doing it right now is because they have the relationships to where they think they can grow the company. I dig it. I think, yeah. I think they're going to do good. It's a plain and simple deal. They, they met the right, you know, called met the right people, made the right friends. They have the people they know they can call. And, and that's the thing, it. his customers, I mean, you know, sit, you know, sitting across, like, I mean, they've, the, the support from them, of, from y'all and all that stuff. I mean, it's just, it's, you see that you see and like, wow, they're, they're helping them out. Not just because they're his buddy, but like they're yeah. helping out. Because, you know, there's yeah. a buddy and they dig, they, they believe in him, you know? So I love seeing that type of uh, support yeah. and, uh, yeah, just kind of support in our industry. And, and I know Cody, I mean, he's got the same attitude I had when I was on service side. Cody would take accountability hundred percent, you know, he will step up and be like, yeah. Hey, if it's our problem, we'll deal with it. We'll fix it. I, dig I know, that. I know him very well. And that's great. I mean, that means I'll call him for work more than other people because I know that. I love that. So anyway, man, Hank, I appreciate you joining us today. Everyone, this is Hank Porter, the, uh, the, the operations manager. Yep. That's it, right? Operation yeah. Man? Okay, Operation Man for uh, Lime Rock. There's a lot of titles out there. You know, they had a little... when they told me they were going to promote me, they asked me what my title wanted to be. Let me ask like... you a question. Talking about titles. Okay, so I just started this thing. Okay, mm -hmm. so what sounds better, principal or founder? Go. I think founder. I think founder. I think because it, it, it's saying that you started something. Okay. Principal, what is that? I, I, don't, yeah, know. I, don't, I don't know what that means either. To me, founder sounds better because it means you built something okay. and you started something. I'm going to do that then. I'm going to switch it back to it was founder. It was principal. I'm going to bring it back to founder. I think I can yeah. do that. Or it could be a CEO of a one man. Somebody called it a firm yesterday. I was yeah, like, that sounds pretty uh, damn important. Yeah. 
Yeah, okay. I'll call it a firm, even though it's yeah, not. Yeah, you're but. founding director of a firm. Okay, I'll take that. Well, that's very important. Yeah. Um, so anyway, mm-hmm. everyone, Hank, thanks for joining me. And everyone, uh, I, I'm not sure when this will be released, but he's going to be on a, the, uh, the Breakfast Run uh, show in uh, October. This might be up by then, actually. I'm dropping two a week. So uh, make sure you tune into that. Uh, you can find uh, that out on uh, connectioncrew.com uh, under the uh, live streams. Uh, you'll see uh, uh, the date and time where uh, Hank's going to be on. So, man, I appreciate it, man. I appreciate your time. I really do. And I love hearing your story and your and your perspective i love the even keelness and the fact that you always challenge yourself and and for those that are listening i think a big takeaway out there is uh literally like don't do the five-year plan uh do, take do the opportunity path yeah take the opportunities that come your way even if it's uncomfortable because that's when you're probably going to grow the most absolutely so all right everyone thanks for tuning in energy crew and we'll talk to you soon yeah.